this is a solid brick wall building. It's a load-bearing brick building. And so this is the bond row. It's the thickness of a brick. And it occurs on this building every seventh course, I think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. In later buildings, it occurs every ninth course, I think. But so this is one brick. This is a brick going back and then another brick. So there's two brick thick. But then there's a third brick. This building is three brick thick. So you see the bond row and two brick. And then you get another row inside. This, and they may, it may be below the floor is four brick thick. Yeah. And, and why did they do that? Why did they make it so thick? Uh, just a load-bearing brick building. That was just the, the th it's unreinforced. There's no structural steel in it. So they just did it for the mass. But I think it's four brick up to the floor. Then it drops back to three brick. We can look at that when we get around to the other side. And what about this brick here on the base? What's all that all about? This is a, a, a 19... I'm not sure what era that is. It's a, it's a, they did it as a French drain to protect the building, you know, because it doesn't have gutters. So this was to keep the water from getting into the basement of the building. Uh, this will come up and we'll determine, you know, the age of this, if this goes back or not. Uh, my instinct would be not to go back. And again, I know exactly where they got this detail. This wasn't common in Georgia. But in Williamsburg, those houses all had this brick trench around those brick houses. The Wyth house, the Wyth house so many of them had this brick, and, and there it was more of a trough, a gutter. Uh, so they got this idea from Colonial Williamsburg, but it was not vernacular to this area. So uh, that's probably done in the, again in the 70s. This is a 70s detail. The, mason, the masons that laid this brick uh, could obviously lay up to a point without scaffolding but once they got to a certain point they had to scaffold the building and the interesting thing that they did and they did this in Williamsburg and they used it as an architectural feature they would lay a pole in one of the joint one of the brick spots and come out and have a vertical so what we do is we we look for the ones that they had to patch back in where they had install their scaffolding. And in Williamsburg, there's a couple of houses that they just left that hole there. But what they had to do after they started coming down with the scaffolding, they had to go back up and fill those holes back in. And so I always find it interesting to look for the brick where the, 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 the scaffolding would have been. And I'm looking on this wall and I had seen a spot right here, that brick there that most likely there was no reason for him to stop and start with that so that probably had a lookout in it for a scaffolding if you follow that line along here you find another one this one right that one right there that little square one see the, the running bond and all of a sudden you hit a little bitty one a small one that that there was no reason for him to go along with brick and suddenly say oh I'm gonna put a small one in so he starts on the end with a pole. He puts one here, comes out. He comes along, and his, his board will span about this long. He puts another one, a, a, just a wood pole. He comes along, look at there, he puts another one. No reason for that, because that's not a bond row. The bond row is just above it. And you can s tell that mortar is a little different. That looks like another place for scaffolding. This one here. There's no reason that he went from that to that. And see how that looks patched in, but yet with original mortar. So what does that tell you? It tells me that he had a piece of a post in here that came out and a leg and he had a board up here so he could stand to lay the brick. Maybe there was one here. Oh, so the post, post would go in there and it would hold up a board? Yeah, the post would, would be, he'd lay it, when he's laying the brick wall, where was it? Here. He had just a round pole, like a fence post. It would, he, he, when he, he laid up to here, he'd lay this post in the building, about that far. And then he would come out with that post, and he would have another post here to hold it horizontal. And then he would have planks. So he would be standing up here, laying his brick. The, the, uh, the only interest in that is, is, is just how they did it. They could have put a post here and here, but then his scaffolding wouldn't have been stable. What would have kept it? You would have to do diagonals. It was just a simple way to scaffold a building as you laid the brick building. And where I learned this was in Williamsburg. I saw it, and they pointed it out. 
so when I came back to Georgia, I started looking at these older brick structures. I found it first in 18, in the courthouse in North Carolina's building in 1857. And you could, you could see it just clear as a bell. This building was, again, either sun-dried, most likely sun-dried brick, or they were fired in a wood-burning kiln, kiln uh, a beehive brick kiln. My guess, with this much dark flash, they, 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 they uh, cured the brick in a, in a wood-burning kiln. Now, what is that? Pretend like you're talking to a third grader. What is the dark, what does that stuff tell you? This, at my knowledge of brick, this darker ones are the ones that were closer to the source of the fire. If you take red clay and you heat it with a blowtorch, it starts to turn this color. Uh, the lighter ones were the ones that were farther away from the fire. And so those are the salmons, and those are the weakest of the brick. So that's where you get the color variation, is this one's very near the fire, this one's very close to the edge. So these are the ones that begin to spall off. Uh, but, and I had one point thought these were sun-dried brick, but I'm, I'm, I'm actually changing my mind. I think they were, I think they were done in a locally in a, in a wood-burning kiln. There wasn't coal burners or gas burners like we have today. And then, but with a wood-burning kiln or even sun-dried brick, they're very porous. And what they did in that time period is they sealed the brick with linseed oil. And the top, you can see under the overhang, the brick has a totally different sheen than it has as you drop down about two feet. It's almost shiny. And so they sprayed it with a linseed oil, which has an amber tint. So the mortar became a little more amber colored and the brick became a little more amber colored. But the most exciting thing that they did is to make them look like the pristine buildings of Colonial Williamsburg and New York and Chicago that were built in the 1820s. Uh, this one being built, you know, with very, very large mortar joints and very irregular surface, whereas those were built with very tight mortar joints. And, and in Chicago, New York in the 1820s, the brick was actually being fired in gas burning killed by the th 1830s. But they penciled the joints to make them look like the pristine buildings of New York. But this is a line of the penciling. But if you look up, up at the top, you see the vertical white lines in between the mortar? Look here, here's one that's very distinct. See that white vertical line? They drew, drew with, a, with a straight edge, the horizontal joints in a very thin mark with line, and then they freehand struck the verticals. And you can see them all over the area underneath the overhang. So this building, when it's restained, not restained, when it's resealed with linseed oil, with the amber tint, and these joints are penciled in, the building looks very pristine. It looks like a building from New York City. So what does a stencil do? Is it an optical illusion? You the talk pencil. About, talk about the that. pencil. Talk about that. What it does. The penciling. Get, once they stain. Once they seal this brick with this amber tinted linseed oil, it all becomes sort of monochromatic. So then they come back with this about three sixteenths of an inch white pencil and draw these lines. And it gives you the illusion of a very high quality, very pristine brick structure. This is bad re repairs, very, very bad repairs done with just regular Portland cement that, that will come off. All of that inappropriate uh, mortar comes out. Comes out. Uh, the one thing we don't do with preservation is we're not going to go through and just I see this happen so many times, but projects, they will go and just rake every joint back. Uh, they call it tuck pointing or repointing. You rake every joint back an inch or so and you put you install new mortar. We will not be doing that. The mortar that's sound, original mortar, that's in good shape, will be left. Mortar that's missing, this, this, this we discussed. Do we actually try to... This, th my recommendation with these is that they're left as they are. And when we go back, and I'm going to talk about what we're going to do to keep that from continuing to deteriorate later. But all of this gray comes out. Now, what is it that, why is that bad mortar? Uh, it's got too much Portland cement in it. It's, it's too hard for this brick and this mortar. It's going to just do nothing but uh, cause it to deteriorate more and more. And they, instead of replacing brick, they just filled it in with mortar. So that all comes out. Well, what does that hard mortar do? What's bad about it? Uh, it, it th this being no Portland cement in this. 
when you mix Portland cement in with this sun-dried brick and this lime mixture, it's too hard. It's harder than this. So as you get thermal contractions and freeze thaw cycles, that Portland doesn't ease, and this does, so it causes this to explode. Just break away. This is the uh, this is the brick that was the farthest away from the fire. If it was, well, if they were kill, killed in a wood burning kiln, and I believe they were, because a sun dried brick wouldn't have had these flash, because that's a brick close to the fire. So this one was a, on the edge, and it didn't get as hot, so it spalled off. But we're not going. I'm not going to propose changing this, because the change would be more de de detrimental than leaving it. But you can't leave it like this because I can. You know, I can just scrape it away, and the, it's not going to stay. But if it's sealed with the linseed oil, it'll be fine. But this building left unprotected, you know, these are going to continue to deteriorate. These these are going to hold up pretty well. But once it's sealed, and this is this is not a one-time deal. This is something that has to be done about every seven years. We are going to re repair all of the the bad mortar and brick replace, get rid of all this modern more Portland cement. That's damaging the building. And then once that's done, we, and I think that's penciling there. Yeah, uh, right there. Then we reseal it with the amber tinted linseed oil and it smells, the, sm the aroma is incredible after you've done it. And then you come back and you take your, heart, your four foot level, you draw the f horizontal lines and you hand strike the verticals. And the reason I know that verticals are hand done is if you get up close enough with them and study them, you can see they're not all just perfect. Now what's a vertical? The vertical joint. Okay. They, they draw these horizontal joints and then they come back and they just draw in the vertical lines with their pencil.